Eh, grazie di essere venuti al secondo incontro di Design Talks, che è scuola politecnica che organizza in collaborazione con la Pitale. E sono molto felice che Richard Wallace, che è qui seduto accanto a me, abbia accettato di venire. E, gli studenti di Visual Design di questa scuola già lo conoscono, eh, in particolare come autore di un libro molto importante sulla storia della grafica, uno dei probabilmente dei meglio fatti. Ma il motivo per cui l'abbiamo invitato qui oggi è proprio il suo ruolo di designer. Il suo, eh, anche quando racconta, racconta la storia del graphic design lo fa sempre con l'occhio del professionista e non con l'occhio dello storico. Eh, gli interessa raccontare come venivano fatte le cose, perché venivano fatte in un certo modo e lui stesso ha delle idee molto chiare e molto precise su qual è il ruolo del designer nella società. E quindi un designer che nei suoi lavori non vedete mai uno stile eh, riconoscibile, una firma Hollis e quello che è riconoscibile è il suo metodo che è sempre molto, molto vicino al contenuto, molto vicino al cliente con cui lavora e ha sempre lavorato nel corso degli anni, praticamente sempre a parte un breve periodo, come designer indipendente e su una piccola scala, su piccoli progetti eh, però è proprio questo non, è, non siamo qui per vedere le grandi cose, ma proprio come si può lavorare con grande fedeltà al, al contenuto. E, Richard è anche una persona dalle idee molto chiare che esprime sempre eh, in maniera diretta e, e chiarissima. Ha vissuto in prima persona un periodo interessante, quello tra gli anni 50 e 60, in cui il modernismo nel graphic design si è diffuso in Europa, ha conosciuto in prima persona quello svizzero l'ha fatto conoscere l'Inghilterra, un paese che se volete è stato un po' estraneo al movimento moderno rispetto ad altri e quindi proprio in quanto rappresentante di questo modo di lavorare, di questa visione del design in un paese che magari eh, non è stato completamente coinvolto è ulteriormente interessante sentire eh, le sue parole. E vedrete un lungo percorso di progetti che comincia negli anni 50, arriva fino adesso Vedrete che ha lavorato soprattutto nel territorio delle arti perché eh, ha una formazione iniziale come artista ma anche un'esperienza pratica della, nella stampa per cui una persona che conosce molto bene le tecniche con queste si confronta. Tutti questi elementi confluiscono nel suo lavoro in un modo che secondo me vale proprio la pena che voi conosciate se non avete ancora avuto occasione di farlo finora. Eh, io approfitto del fatto che qui con noi in prima fila c'è Italo Lupi che magari voglia dire anche lui due parole su, sul lavoro di Richard e poi gli passiamo la, la parola. Sì, eh, Potete passare la parola immediatamente a Richard Hollis perché quello che ha detto Silvia mi sembra assolutamente completo rispetto al suo lavoro, io potrei aggiungere solo un benvenuto a lui e ricordare l'emozione che ho avuto quel giorno che a Londra ho comprato il suo libro Precise History of Graphic Design e mi sono accorto come si poteva fare un libro di storia del design in un modo differente e accorgermi, per me è un modo abbastanza emozionante, di vedere, riconoscere in modo molto forte e stabile la scuola che lui ha chiamato Scuola del Design, questo libro che io ritenevo e ritengo ancora anche erede di una tradizione inglese nell'affrontare la storia in un modo molto chiaro e molto semplice, io quando ero ragazzo leggevo i libri di storia, cose che non riguardavano la grafica, ma non so, la storia dell'Inghilterra, del Trevelyan, o la storia d'Italia di Dennis Max Smith e agli storici inglesi che si occupano di raccontare i grandi avvenimenti del mondo o gli avvenimenti di una disciplina come quella del design, devo riconoscere una chiarezza che nel libro di Richard è straordinaria. Io mi ricordo alcune riviste che avevo visto negli anni 60, credo, eh, tra cui spiccava questo libro, credo, appartenente al corrente del laburismo fabiano, forse, eh, New Society, e che aveva questa chiarezza di impostazione che ricordava il suo amore per la noia grafica svizzera, credo, un po' anche nell'impostazione generale. Riconosco in lui un'amicizia con Facetti, per esempio, perché credo che l'impegno tipo anche sociale che ha contraddistinto tutti i suoi lavori sia una eh, derivazione da queste frequentazioni straordinarie che in quegli anni potevano essere esercitate. Niente, non mi dilungo perché sarei noioso, passo la parola a Silvia. E io passo la parola a Richard, 
Well, uh, thank you again, Richard, for accepting our invitation. And well, <laughs> after maybe I will ask you a few questions because it would be interesting to get more in detail. But then now it's fine. This microphone. Thanks. Sono molto onorato di essere qui a Milano. Per noi il, il, il centro del design del mondo è la volta. Sono molto scacciente di non saper parlare italiano. And so I will speak, I'm sorry, in English. But I hope you will be able to be seeing things on the screen which will to some extent explain themselves. Um, I'm going to talk about largely about folding, folding pieces of paper. So it's not a theoretical talk. And although I now write about design history, and as well, as well as design. I started working as a designer um, more than 50 years ago. So it's with examples of my own work that I'll illustrate what I'd like to say. So inevitably this is also a, a talking about history because most of the work predates it, it is before the computer was used, that is to say it was before digital typesetting and the possibility of bringing images onto a screen and manipulating them, which had to be done almost physically. That's to say most of the work is from the period of, of photography, it was from the period of chemistry. And a great deal of the work is before full colour four color printing was economic and another aspect of the work that I'm going to talk about is the question of economy. Um, in other words maximizing the possibilities, the opportunities that are available um, in a sense to give value for money which makes it exciting to invent ways of doing things. The other aspect is the consideration of the person who is using what is they are presented with, what happens when they take something out of an envelope or how something is sent to somebody and also how it is done with the print. Now, the first image on the screen I'm starting with perhaps the most boring, but what is often misunderstood is that graphic design is part of an industrial process and a large part of it is this question of huge sheets of paper which are then folded up and in many ways this controls how something looks because you are starting with often with fixed sizes of paper, fixed processes and a whole fixed technology. Now folding I suppose is almost an obsession with me. It's something that has fascinated me. And this is um, something that I did in an amateurish way in the early 1960s after I'd been to Cuba, just after the Castro Revolution. And I simply took photographs. They were taken on a square format camera and I wrote about my experiences and made what was a large sheet of paper by having the photographs turned into screened negatives and placing all these negatives on a piece of 
transparent film over a glass top table, which was a normal table at which I had. So that it is in a way done purposely in a rather crude way to show that this is not a design, it is something else, and it is printed all in black. And the lettering in the top left where it says I, 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 I being the point that it is from a personal point of view, that it is not uh, objective. Um, and there's a passport stamp which makes the other colour in the top right hand corner, so there's an entry to keep on the top left and a, an exit stamp on the bottom right. These were very similar stamps which I had many. So that shows this sort of folding, and this was so for one penny, in, in other words, uh, whoever took it made a loss selling it. Now, I worked for many years for a London art gallery, and this is, this, this is what somebody who was on the mailing list of the art gallery took out of the envelope. Now there is a complete message in this part of the Paper. So when it is unfolded, you see much more of the message. So you imagine what is happening when somebody is receiving this, and we'll see more of this when it became more sophisticated later. But you can see that in each part of the phone, there is a separate piece of information. I'm sorry that you can't see the bottom, which is a shirt I can tell the patient, which is very appropriate to show it here. Now, as I worked for longer at White Chapel, it became obvious that while we disliked the Deutsche Industrie and London, the dim sizes of paper because of their, I would say, unesthetic format. It was simply practical because of folding things into envelopes to use these, the dim size of the paper. And this is all the posters from the White Chapel Gallery at this time were sent out as um, A3 sheets folded to go into a business envelope. So that here is the envelope and with coming out of it is a news sheet telling people what was going on in the this exhibition and giving a summary. And also, in darker colour, an invitation to the private view. So all these things came out of the same envelope. And this was the news sheet when it was folded up to the size of a business envelope. Now, all the work at this time was printed only in two colours and it was done by pasting up every element and for example this sculpture by the English uh, sculptor uh, letter designer Eric Gill was given a texture which was slightly stony by putting it in a process camera with a particular screen which is the sort of thing nowadays it does do in Photoshop. But in those days it did the design of the on a process camera and then pasted it up. And this was given to the printer as what was then called camera ready copy. When the new sheet was opened, this is what it looked like. So that as the person opened it, gradually it unfolded uh, the information. The typeface that was used was something which was in late 19th century typeface, which appeared at about the same time as the White Chapel Art Gallery was built, that's why it was chosen. And so everything, all the headings were done in this block typeface, and all the texts throughout were done in centuries. This is the front of a guide to, an ex to the same exhibition, um, again with the same typefaces. We tried never to print in black ink and never to print in white paper. I don't know why, but it was kind of another of these strange obsessions at the time. 
This is the set, this was a two-part exhibition, so these are the things that came out of the envelope from the second exhibition. And this was the new, the second exhibition is the gallery of guide using the large um, Roman figures of the Octave face to separate the sections. And this was actually an eight-page document, which was unusual. Well, the architect, Christopher Wren, we made an ordinary A4 poster as well as a very big poster, so that the poster came out of the envelope together with this guide to the exhibition. Again, you can see this printing in two colours. This was, in fact, printed with black as well as this dark maroon colour. And Christopher Wren's signature used with him is uh, Simonamentary Queries to Con Speeches. The slogan of after his death and so on. If you want to see what Christopher Wren built, look about you. And on the back of this new sheet was a map which meant that the exhibition, in a sense, continued in the streets because he would walk around the city of London using this map in these circular, these dots, you can see are in fact numbers, and the numbers refer to the churches which people could visit on the map. And this was the new sheet which people would have taken out of the envelope. Again, they printed in red and green, not, not using black. And here's a more complicated use of two colours using an orangey red and a blue so that the image of the early the immigrants to the east end of London is shown on the right in a documentary photograph which is in fact printed as a duotone in red and blue and then almost every element of the lettering on the left is these again made up of it is either red on the background or red and blue printed over one another. The date for to 21st of August is red on blue to give this black effect. And similarly with the main sights and sounds of the direction of East End is also um, made up of tints, various percentages of red and blue. Now, all, all these A3 posters, as you can, you can just about see where they, they were folded up. So, if you look at the top left part of the poster, you would have at the white sheet. So, as you took the thing out of the envelope, you would see what it was. Again, printed red and green, and the at the bottom you have the you've got Polish photography using Polish red and white colours and again using red and green which is something used a great deal. This is simply red and a darker red printed on a yellow paper. You can see here the folds go as much vertically to divide up the information into these little parcels of information so that you get 80 for general and then the, uh, when it's open and the V on one side then you get the white chap on the central column which is like an art gallery missionary in the central column so I'm played with the actual uh, textual content now a rather more complicated use of folding was in a poster for the Biennale 20 years ago, um, where well, this was the poster printed only in Italian, a large poster, much uh, probably about A1 size. And when it was folded up, printed on the back of it, was 
the information about me, the exhibition, and about the artist, and on the right hand side, a catalogue. Now, the top half is all the text in English, on the bottom half, all the text in Italian. And by the way it was folded, you had one set if you went into the British Pavilion where it was folded up in such a way that this is what you picked up. You picked up the English, or you picked up the Italian when it was folded in a different way. But everybody thought, both the poster and the catalogue and an introduction, for, for nothing. This was the, when you saw the English side and the lens that was folded up. So that was the other side of this. Now, I showed the poster again because part of this drive for economy was actually to use the separations, the film separations, for the full color printing on the poster. That section of the poster was used to make the whole wrap up for the catalog which was once separate. And you can see where the image folds round as a, a jacket to the book on the inside. And you can see one of the other interests, of course, is to try to retain a continuity between all the items which belong to a particular event, a particular exhibition, so the same typefaces that are used throughout. Even more complicated and earlier than this were um, catalogues for two artists who were being shown together in the same gallery. And you can just about see at the bottom of this the way it is folded that the front in colour is actually this is a card outside to this, which we'll see in a moment. And you can see the names of the artists down at the bottom in one in red at the bottom is Geoffrey Cap. So that as the thing unfolds, and this is this is the other artist as well we'll show at the same time around Neil. And you can just about see the folds here. So that on the other side, when it was unfolded. The colour cover which you just see is on the back of the top element here. So on one side you've got a colour cover and on the other side you've got a catalogue. And on the other side of that you had the individual um, essays and introductions to these artists' works. Now, these were both printed together. The exhibition went together and the printing went together. So this was printed as, as one piece of card on the outside and one piece of paper on the inside and then cutting them off. So this was all in maximizing the amount of money that was available to do the job and to end up with every one you hope be pleased. Um, the reason for this um, particular way of unfolding was that the artist Geoffrey Camp um, painted at the seaside and probably here, but in every tourist place, certainly in England at the seaside, you had postcards which unfolded in exactly this way. Often you could then tell them off and send them out so that this was a, a, an acknowledgement of where this particular artist was. Now, it seems that this way of working became a habit, but I, until sorting out things for this talk, I haven't realized that actually I've done the same sort of thing again, a good deal probably about 10 years after that. Now, this again was an exhibition of uh, the Crafts Council in London, which at that time had a very large gallery. And it was a joint exhibition of somebody who was a woodcarver who made 
wooden plates and all kinds of wooden objects. He turned on very complicated lathes which he devised himself. And also there was an exhibition of pottery by English potters. Now this was the poster for the two exhibitions together when they were at the Crafts Council. Now, the exhibitions individually then both toured around England to different venues. <coughs> so, the, this poster had that central section removed from the printing plates of the black and the green paint. So, that you ended up with this because this is uh, black, blue, um, orange, and green. So it was, in fact, using the four units of the printing press. Now, this was then cut down the middle, because on the back was printed the catalogue for this, um, for, for the David Pyatt, the woodcarver. And the other side had all the printing on the back of it. This is done back only the pottery catalogue. Now, I did the same sort of thing for various galleries. This was for the, what was called the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford, for which I, for which I did all the letterheads and a lot of stationery. But four, about four London designers shared between them the, the whole season. So one would do the spring exhibition, and then another one would do another exhibition. And then we would take it in turns until eventually a large design firm took over the whole thing and we were all out of work. Um, but this again was a folder. So it unfolded in a similar way, but on, in a much bigger way. Um, and there were, as you can see, there were several exhibitions went on at the same time. So you had both the Soviet exhibition together with Wayne Michaels, with films and photographs, and also a, a fairly conventional painter. And then on the right hand side you had listed um, the whole um, calendar of, it, of events of the gallery. Um, part of this was that you could fold it around so that you had the events listed as a calendar as a quite simple thing. You could even cut it off. The idea was that people could then stick it on their door of their refrigerator. This was another folder, a much more general one. Um, one of the things you may notice is a maybe also peculiar session is the use of punctuation. The, uh, quotation marks at the beginning of this <coughs> phrase and at the end, and then saying here in Oxford, it's somehow a way of making text more as though it's somebody speaking to you. Um, now, with this also, where is here in Oxford? In fact, this is an aerial view of Oxford. And we'll see what happens when you unfold it. And then peek down in a little circle on the right as there, as there they're being spying. Is people going into, crowding into the gallery here in also. Then when it was unveiled, a list of exhibitions here in Oxford, there are all these things going on in this year of 1985. And so the whole program is displayed. It's very difficult for, for, to see vertically, but the dates are in these blue vertical strips. Again, this is something as you could have printed in only two prints in blue and black. And this is the other side of the leaflet, so that on the right hand side you see this um, area of photograph taken from the air. And you see this little arrow pointing down to actually where the gallery is in Oxford. Most people in Oxford would have known uh, more or 
as Oxford, but they very rarely, in those days, this was a long time before you had Googles, which would show you what things were going on from the app. So it was something which actually intrigued people because this was directed more to people in Oxford than the people outside. You can see, incidentally, on the left hand side where this um, logo is, so the way the words Museum of Modern Art Oxford are. I hope I've amended this by putting a little face, some eyes at the bottom of it to, to give it a, a little edge of the Another ex exhibition which affected the way in which you made a, a folder for it, or an unfolder, was if you had four designers, four people and their designs, it was inevitable and that's that you chose um, an unfolder which had four parts to it. What I may as well also mention that is because these artists were working more or less in the 1930s. They, the, the typeface that was inevitable and used the Guild typeface, which was designed and uh, used first around that period. And this it was seen used for the text as well. But you can see that a story of four people and their designs inevitably divides in this way so that you get Bendings and Lancelings and Kittings and E. K. Nicholson with each having a little section to themselves. So that you can use the structure of a piece of paper actually to structure the, the message, although the message will suggest also conversely the structure of the paper, of the graphic. This is a, an invitation printed on very, very thin paper, rather very recent which unfolded in this way, you can see how thin the paper is. Again, it's printed in only two printings. It's very difficult to make out the type at the top, which was the, um, it was actually just a tint of grey. And the, the painter used a lot of silver paint. And what I did very briskly was to print a silver half tone with with black, a black tone, one on top of another, which, um, when it was unfolded, looked like this, so it had a sort of sheen. And this is actually a reproduction of a work by this artist who used messages with stints of lettering in this particular exhibition on this sort of ground. So it was again almost as though the person receiving this in the mail was also receiving part of an artwork. Now, this is a, a photograph where the actual cutting of the paper contributes to how it is. Again, it is a, a mixture of the content determining how things work. Now, on the right hand side, you see these very narrow folders, which as you unfold them, um, you can see that they, they go with a CD of um, um, what you might call modern music, modern classical music. And each track that you see on the top, the third column to the right, it says 8901 which shows the point at which this sign appears on the CD. And when this is unfolded, it produces this kind of depth structure. Now, again, this was printed in this way, on a single piece of paper. Then it was cut diagonally. And after it was folded, then the top trimmed off, so that you got the top and the bottom flat. If this is all a uh, cream colour, it's just that the photograph makes it. Now, 
This is rather moving on to what are really sheets of paper folded up still. Sheets of paper which have been allowed on for after folding, glued on the folded side, or trimmed on the pre other side to produce pages which uh, are a technique which has existed for the past centuries. And what I was showing here was the way of attempting to integrate the elements of a book which involves less folding than the question of sequence. But sequence is something which is inevitably involved in unfolding, uh, the sort of brochure that we've been looking at. So there you are. The story unfolds more as you turn the pages. And putting, and from the cover, which should tell the person picking it up. And what I often, often try to do, as you'll see, is to try to make people pick up a book in a bookshop, know what it's about, by having plenty of words. But here, this was trying to say that avant-garde graphics is not to do with design historians, but is to do with people at the time in the background photograph. So that when you open the book, instead of having graphics, you get the people who were the receivers of the graphics at that period, in fact, after the first of all. And then, in a way, the book then unfolds in a way so that the credits and the contents appear here together with the beginning of the content. And then it goes into the actual content of, of the book, the essay, it's illustrated essays. And at the back, you, as it were, tie up the back with the front by repeating some of the image which people have already seen on the front. And then you end on the back when you have an appearance inside the by placing the barcode within the within something that reflects the pattern of the front of the book, you're almost turning people round back onto the front, back onto the front. Now, here is a particular example of using text to grab the person in the bookshop because after all, people who are in the bookshops are readers and they're not merely consumers of images. So that if you begin to talk about what is in the book, you may be going some of the way to encouraging people to buy it. And even if it is on the shelf where you see only the spine of the book, maybe you're going to be intrigued by seeing a lot of words. And when you turn on the back of the book, it even continues with what has started on the front. And this is something, again, which the first version of this book on the left had the, what is usually described as the blurb, had the blurb on the front, so that the, and the main subtitle of the book, Three Hundred Years of Women's Oppression and Fight Against It, actually goes at the bottom. When the book was redone, it was, they asked me simply to do it with the text over the And um, one of the books in which I was involved, we began the text on the front, of course, it's impossible then to continue the text from the front inside the book because of all kinds of reasons. You can't, because people, well, certainly when this book was produced, people had libraries, rebound books, so that the continuation of the front of the book, the missing of the front of the book, would in fact be missing. Although Kendrick's now republished it so that the the rest of the text does continue.
seen them inside the room, and it's actually a travesty of the way we designed the inside of the room. This magazine I worked for actually for 40 years doing covers, so there were a great, great many covers. And this is simply, I'm showing because again, it was something where a lot of words, all the poets who are in this issue were put on the front. And just anecdotally with this um, cover, the photograph has nothing to do with Poland in the in London, but I thought it was, it looked like people's idea of what Warsaw might be like. And it was taken by a student with a Polish name, so I thought it fit said what his name was on the front. It would give a sort of credibility to, to it. The other interesting thing, you see there's a sort of thermometer there on the left hand side. Um, to um, show that it is a double issue. In other words, you, um, it, it's a kind of measurement that this is thicker to remind people that they're getting two instead of the normal one. Now about covers, this is unusual in the sense that this was a book which was literally a pocket book. That's to say it was designed for workers actually to have, to carry around with them, particularly people who were, belonged to a union, because so many people were injured at work that, and were not aware of it, and they weren't aware of um, chemicals they would get, for example, to clean machinery, how they were protected on building sites itself. And the front of the book, the whole book tried to use the kind of typographical language which was used by what in England is called the Red Top newspapers, the most popular newspapers, which in those days used and usually used the Times as the typeface. So they, and they used a lot of bullets and to stimulate, to give a lot of visual stimulus, to break down the content so that it was easily accessible. And since this was meant to be actually a handbook, what was in the book had to be easily found. So the contents page was designed, I hope, as clearly as possible. And the use of bold, italic, and the ordinary weight of times gave a lot of variety so that emphasis would be given. People could, who were reading could pick up what they were looking for as quickly as possible. And in newspapers, they were used to reading little, very short bits of information. So the book was designed also using this kind of language. So both the textual language and visual language were similarly as, as simple and accessible as possible. It even had sections where, which were almost like a crossword, where there were boxes which ticked, and uh, to make people really engage with them. So in a conventional book, you wouldn't have something which spelt out, this section is about the hazards, but you would simply go straight into talking about it. So that everything was there, and it was repeated and emphasized. A quite different sort of book. This was the cover to a book on English fashion photography. So that is the cover. Often it's the opposite to one way you have a lot of words. There are no words at all. So the intrigue comes not from the verbal content because after all it was a book of photographs. Now anecdotally you can see incidentally the way the cover is wrapping around on 
left hand side when the book is open. In this case, you will see that the, what happened in fact, the young person that was working with me at the end of laying out the book, I said, there aren't enough pages. So we're going to do I can't, can't fit them in. And he simply said, well, why don't you, let's put the title page on the back. And so the miniature of the back of the book is put on the title page together with the introduction of the book. So the back of the book looks like this. And the cat, there were no captions to the pictures in the book. So that you had to look through the back of the book where you saw a miniature black and white version of the photographs that were used throughout the book. And you identified them and saw what they were. At the bottom of each column is the actual title of the photograph. Some of them had two on the left hand page of Donald Christie had just two photographs listed at the bottom underneath their list of their that biography. And the next artist of Ed Constantine has three and so on. So that um, if the, in a picture book, in a way the fewer words that interfere with the pictures, the better. And, and in a sense it's more engaging because it's more like a puzzle for the reader. And here you can see the title of the page, but you unfold it. The back of the cover, and I'm very keen on using the kind of packaging board which is used to print to, uh, like cornflakes packets or cereal packets, which is often glazed on one side and rough on the other, so that the outside the cover was printed on rough paper. So when you felt it in the hand, it also felt slightly rough. But here it was very glossy and smooth, and so we printed this photograph, which believe it or not is a fashion photograph. So it was on the inside of the cover and on the inside of the back cover. So the book was in a sense a sandwich between the photograph. The quite different book was a catalogue an exhibition on paintings by the 19th century English artist Turner, which was all, many of Turner's uh, pictures, some of which were being restored, they were all taken out of their frames and exhibited without their frames. And the idea was, in a way, to make a comparison between Turner's paintings, certainly his later paintings, and American abstract expressionist paintings. And it doesn't show very well, but in fact, I printed gold inside the book to show that this was what was missing when things were exhibited. Um, and because the notion of the sun was part of the um, Turner's obsession, this was repeated um, throughout. One thing about uh, these, the way the paintings are reproduced is that they all had a tint, a very pale tint around the image so that the paintings were reproduced, printed straight onto the white paper, but around them wasn't white paper, but a very slight tint, which to try to make the pictures look relatively brilliant. And this was the background of all. These are bar are always uh, difficult to handle, and um, it's often not realized that it's better to put them in a code colour, you can't put them in a warm colour because they're not read by the scanner. But also if they could be made much smaller than this, of course. Now about book covers, this was the front cover to an exhibition of 
photographs. They were photographs taken by international photographers about the family. And the exhibition was called Who Was Looking at the Family? Now, this front is printed on a piece of heavy board, the sort of thing that you make um, files of to classify um, things or used to it, classify um, papers or filing papers. And this was the back. Now, both the front, they had holes cut out of this board. And this was stuck on an ordinary binding, where you can see this, this pinkish colour. Pink being something which I associated with, I don't know, certainly with, with babies, but it was meant to be a little sweet and have the something of the character of this image that is on, on the front. Um, so that the, this photograph on the front was the family, who's looking at the family. And who was looking at the family was you. And this is, it doesn't show very well in this photograph, but there's a piece of mirror board also put behind the cutout back of the, of the book. So that you had, the book became, if you like, an, an object. It was fairly conventional inside. Now, this question of the book being some, an object of three dimensional to try to um, integrate the fronts and backs. I think maybe I've begun to uh, illustrate that, but inside, of course, a right house, you have something, you have the, the, the case binding, which somehow has to work when people have thrown the wrap of the dust cover away and still relate to the inside of now, I only show you these because it raises a question which is connected with the business of folding. Because often, if you are working with photographs, and it is a historical document, there may be photographs which don't demand colour. The way the sheet of paper folds when it is going through the press, it is possible that colour may be available for more economically used only in certain positions on the sheet of paper, therefore in certain positions in the book. So a great deal of juggling has to be done to get these in the right position. And this is the same book on Russian photographs, and I only show this because of this dilemma of if you have horizontal photographs, horizontal images, and you have vertical book, what do you do? Do you do what has been done here? This is something which, um, in a magazine, you can always go across a spread and put something horizontal, something very, which is very crystal in a book. And I'm often inclined just to turn the book around. So the, the landscape picture, you have to turn the book around. But this is a, it's just interesting when you're showing it smaller within the text, this is from the same um, book, then of course it's not a problem because you can have them across two columns where they don't look too small. This, and similarly, if you're doing a walk by Phil, this is a book by Godard, the French director. You know that all the images are going to be of a particular proportion, so you can work it so that you can devise a grid which will fit the images within the video. This is in fact a book which is too complicated to talk about. It's all this the bedroom. So this is the poster for the garden, unfortunately, I think in many ways. On the poster side, I had the, that mistake of uh, trying to get lots of images. On the basis of the if the poster is in the metro, it would have a lot to look at and puzzle over. I think it's a questionable idea. But then this was a very complicated job, perhaps one of the most complicated I've ever done. Anyway,
relates to folding in a very special way because this was a travelling exhibition about the role of, of women in Britain. And it also had a book which went with it. Because it was a travelling exhibition, the whole exhibition had to go into packing cases and they had to be packing cases small enough to go through a particular doorway and they are playing in Latin America. I worked fortunately with some architect friends and this, around this, you can see perhaps a, a more or less a triangular spider form on the right hand side of this image. Um, but I hope you can see perhaps what looks like a, a woman's dressing table. Uh, and on the right hand side of this, over, you can see an ironing board with an iron and something waiting to be ironed. And on the other side of this, which you can't see, was the students. So there were mock up rooms which were meant to tell people in other countries this went to. In, in it, and um, they they picked a strange idea of uh, English women being, but it did show. You can see in the background of this uh, photograph the panels which were put on these uh, structures, which were made up of. They, they depended upon the size of photographic paper. Um, has your image gone dark? No. Um, but you can see, um, also it talked about the, um, on the right hand side you can see the suffragette movement of the early 20th century, the policeman arresting someone. And you can see in a cage uh, the English Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher. With Winston Churchill, we thought this would be allowed, but somehow this was presented by the British Council. Allowed. But it's really a question of organising all a number of photographs into a structure, but a structure which is more complicated than before. And this was one of the pages of my notebook at the time, which shows um, these curved structures and try to devise ways in which the different elements of the exhibition would fit. On the top right of the page, I can see that it's the ABC that is dealing with history. And then below that it goes on to protest and, and so on the different the work, the family, the family and, and so on. Because because these were double-sided, it was very complicated because photographs had to be backed up with some another photograph on the other side, so the, the numbering of them, so that they could be put together by people who had never seen the exhibition from somewhere else, it was extremely complicated. But this is what the exhibition was about. These are two separate photographs, that's the one on the left and one on the right, they're joined together. And you can see that also statistics were used, and you can see just about in, in the middle distance another circle there. Isotype figures are shown, for example, show the number of nurses in hospitals. Um, and there are various quotations from feminist theory work that is put on the text. And here you can see the kitchen, which was built. So that um, walking around, they, it was a very varied experience for normal <coughs> British people to see. And this is the book in which um, the photographs were put. So the structure was really um, very different. But I often have used the technique of taking details from this one photo and put it and repeating it in another. I think that's uh, 
probably shown here that there is would be in a circular photograph part of a photograph that is shown to be somewhere else to emphasize exactly what it was someone was doing. Stitching was 42 millimeters down, but is in quite the wrong place. 
but it should be in the gap between Beanie and British, that stitching should have gone exactly through the middle. But because I wasn't aware it was being made, I didn't see that they helped. I assumed that they would turn over some of the um, some of the image so on the inside of the bag, because as in print, you would allow three millimeters beyond what you needed. So in fact, it's three millimeters in the wrong position. So the only lessons always go to where something is being made. Because also for just social reasons, because it's it's fun, and you get to know the people who are actually doing things, and also you put things right. Or you can change your mind to the degree and change the color. Or many jobs which are part I would stand with the printer mixing the ink because and it's often true that if you specify the pantone and you see something being printed, it's nothing like the pantone. Although they may be that's the next for me to talk about books that some or I was some going to say but um, if you'd um, like to ask anything or anyone wanted to know about other things just to say so please ask I think your first slides, uh, I saw the typography, uh, which uh, was made uh, by one. And I would like to ask about this typography. This was the type for gallery. I, I don't remember the name of this gallery. The first project. So, um, a, a German typeface made by Bertolt called the Block, the Block Bow, um, which is it's now digitized. The, um, the reason for using it also, at that time, you couldn't get it anywhere. I was very keen to use it. And so I photographed the type from a specimen <coughs> and then pasted it on letter by letter. All these things I don't know to write. This is why this is history. <laughs> because in those days, the, the, but I, I'll go on about it for a bit. The point being that I chose block because. It wasn't a shop, it had no right angles. So that when you enlarged photographically, it didn't look out of focus. So that was one of the main ways of using it. And later, I, I drew, you see the um, numerals here, 1918 to 1970, there are lining numerals. And normally, I would use the lining Figures, numerals, to go with capital letters. But in at this stage, you'll see that 22 July, they are nine figures. Nine. And they're still nine here, but then they're with the capitals. So today it looks very, very good. I think it's very reaction. I'm hoping to find it where I. Because I had, I drew non-lining figures. Was there some? Oh yes, in 1982. Can you just see that? Uh, next to one, seven, two, three. 
Any other questions? Ci sono altre domande? Da, um, perché magari comincio a farne qualcuno anch'io. Uh, well, I really thank you, Richard, for being so honest and so clear about the way you work, because it doesn't always happen in lecture, because people tend to stress the visual side of their work and don't, don't always go into such detail, explain how it works and why and when. It was done, so this is an extremely interesting aspect of how you present your work now. And thank you for that. And, uh, um, okay. and you work all your career, or mostly all of your career, as an independent designer, not... Maybe I heard that you maybe work for a publisher for a short time. Yes. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, was it... Can you talk about this kind of choice you did? The, the choice of remaining small, working for small clients and for some specific uh, areas like arts and publishing and so on? Okay. It, it, it was, uh, in a way, there was no choice other than to work for this. I don't know how I, I have I did once work in, in Paris for the um, publicity studio of the store Gary Lafayette. Um, but otherwise I've always worked just as a one man band and, and intermittently have one person as an assistant. When I thought I would be too old ever to have to come to terms with computers, but unfortunately uh, the computers overtook me and I learned by having um, people who came to work for me as uh, for work experience and I'd say that um, they did the work and I got the experience because I learned from them how to do um, Quark Express and this uh, all these um, this sort of thing and People, different people came from different schools and they all had different ways of doing things. So, um, I, now my computer skills are, are very 
extraordinary diverse and very, very limited. Um, and so there are so, so many things that uh, are impossible. But of course what the computer has done for my generation is to give so much control. But the problem with the computers is that you can make decisions so quickly and a new thing appears on the screen and you can, because it's there, it seems wonderful. But when you were pasting up letter by letter, you were thinking about what you were going to do next, or you were listening to the radio. But with a computer, I find it impossible to do anything other than words, because everything is happening so fast. The thing about a computer is that you can adjust, for example, for typography, it's absolutely wonderful, because you can adjust it and make space and you can move things around so easily. The problem is for the, the, the young people I know, work as designers, they then are sitting at their computer if they're working for a company and someone comes and stands behind them and says, couldn't you make that green? And in, you know, in the old days that would be impossible because the cost would make it prohibitive and you couldn't make changes without it costing money. So it's that it was for us, I think it was easy, much, much easier. Because you got specialists in the way that people came to you and said, I'm, I've got this problem, I want to tell people about this and that. And now they send you something, like email, they always tell us, and say, oh, turn it into this or that. And it's not, you know, you, in, I say, in the old days, when I first started, we, and when I first taught, every student for any job would produce a questionnaire. So when I worked for somebody who packaged coal, I gave them a long questionnaire asking all the questions about their business and who bought it and how it was packed, everything. So if you had a complete understanding of what their problem was, which wasn't about an advertisement on a local paper. It was about connecting with people who might buy it. It might, you might have ended up having to put something in the local paper. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't really the problem. But now it's like the, the patient coming to the doctor and saying, oh, will you cure this with such and such medicament? Not, I've got a pain in my leg, whatever it is. So the whole relationship between the design and the client, I think, has changed dramatically because of the computer's partly because all this information comes into you as a design which you then have to transform into what there is, something like what they're expecting. It's, in a way, it's, it's, less, it's less interesting. So I'm, I'm very lucky because I've worked mainly for, for, for friends. Uh, all people who ask me to do things have become friends. So it's uh, only a man that has been a very uh, easy relationship between um, designer and client. Please do, because it's <laughs> nobody. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, before creation of a book project, uh, for example, this poster, you did uh, the sketch, yeah? You, you make the sketch uh, by hands. Uh, and uh, this sketch uh, there is everything dates, typography, the place of water. Because now we do everything with the computer. We, we are just thinking before, okay, we will use actually in the desk and this photo and uh, so on. And after in computer, we are mm, thinking to place this here and this here. And uh, if you can tell a little bit about how to prepare these sketches in the project. Okay. To prepare the project of the book. Uh,
Well, if there are so many different, my preferred way is to work directly. Would you like to see things? I have got another. Is this? If people can go home if they. Like, but I have. I've got another disc which is about which is about books. Would that interest you? Because that would tell you more about um, about books. I would go through it very quickly. Then. Direi che possiamo approfittare dell'opportunità di vedere un altro lato del suo lavoro, visto che il progetto di libri è qualcosa che Richard Hollis sa fare con veramente una capacità fuori dal comune. Avete intravisto qualcosa prima della qualità dei suoi progetti, quindi adesso approfitterei. Questo è un progetto di libri. Ok, quindi è bello se puoi Well, they all look bored. People who want to stay are still here, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, while you're preparing your next presentation, can I just make a very small, well, very short question, which is related to your other career as a writer. So can I? Okay, first of all, okay. first of all, I want to thank you for the book that you wrote, the one that, uh, about graphic design history, because most of of us studied on that book, and so we owe you something. Uh, second question is, uh, in this moment, are you, did you ever plan to make a kind of a compendium of that book? Because I, I feel like lost after a while. Because you just made a, 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 the last part of the book, which is talking about the contemporary of graphic design, which is just a little part, is not really spread up as it should be probably. And I think I missed that. Uh, do you have any plans of uh, make another book or a compendium or something talking about the more contemporary graphic design? I don't, I have no plans to write about contemporary graphics, really, because because I, obviously I see it around me, but because it is, that will usually be, because I'm, I'm not into Sure. 
knowledge that's a historic right about the work which you uh, find you're deeply and sympathetic to. If people who've come to London, for example, to lecture, who I find so unsympathetic, yet that I realize that they're also very important because, and I suppose I can say why I think they're important, but it's very awkward to write about things of that sort of thing. I think also because it's too close to us, it's not easier to write about something because if you like the things are separate, so what is important has you can see it's a historical place. Whereas for the more recent place, you can only see it's a place in that moment. Um, and it would be difficult to assign value to it. And I think that's inevitably a history, particularly some, but it's also designed as bound to ascribe values to things, or even implicitly. So I, I don't think I could do it. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm trying to stop uh, designing on doing writing and just publishing what other people write, uh, which is in the literary sphere, not, not in the design sphere. Maybe you just also probably, as you can know, probably less able to assimilate a great variety. Well, well, it's now so merry all over the world. It's not just for a very important thing. It's also best for the audience. But if you don't understand, or if you're unable to read the language, or sit with something, then it's very difficult, for example. I don't want to have the right to have to the Chinese design in any intelligent way because of the, the culture is so language. And it's very strange that the that graphic design has been one of its first translations was into the real. And you know, I couldn't write a really if 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 um, one of your colleagues wanted to something said about the book design, which I was going through very, very quickly. This is also how I would go about it, the fantastic, how people have Because there was a move to try to make books into a different medium after the Second World War. With the Nation of the with the last week, with the Holy with the Holy Nanosh from Kepesh from the Bauhaus, who tried with the books like Language and Vision and Vision, who tried to make them. These people produce books like this, trying to suggest that the book should reflect the age in which they were made by the chairman and top leftists, um, obviously, uh, from the 18th century, and reflects its time, whereas the Eames below is obviously reflected on the same our time and, and so on. And the fact that the book dates from the 15th century, it seemed, hadn't changed much. This was thought to be foolish. This was a writer I worked with, John Burge. And this is, because I think the contact with the, the writer is a way the most important thing. And what the level of the law is this, is the what's on the screen now, these blank pages into which we have to fit. Now, this is what the image has trailed and when you ask how much went to buy design. The notion of a, a book, the notion of a flat man, seeing what the chapters are, what, what is contained in, and then working with them. This was quite a small catalogue for an exhibition. Um, so that it, it didn't need a great deal of planning because it was with the back of my book. It could always be done with a flat planner of this sort. And then on the right hand side, you will see how the page is structured. Um, because I plainly decided it had to be in two columns because um, probably when I talked about having a landscape picture and a vertical picture, books being mainly vertical, if you've if you got different proportional pictures, a square, which can be economical because you can get 12 pages out of an size sheet, 12 or 24, um, it can be an economical. 
Se non è una cosa, non è una cosa. E usually, se è possibile, si può sedere con l'autore e parlare di quello che vogliono fare. Um, I just go through it. This is you know, one of the early um, unjustified left Eric Gill type of This is by Edward Johnson, the manager of the London Underground. Um, this was how he made writing that originated in Ettrick, which I think is an absolutely classical book. Because although it looks uh, terribly nice, it's also it is being stoned. So if you've got the page on the right, he's used only one type of but he's actually used so many varieties of the rather like that as it would work before in the to break out the text so that it will be followed with very practical typography. I only show this because it's set in real time and in that earlier essay on typography, the page I chose said that the only place you can't use Gill is for an ecclesiastic. Text. And this is for this is this is that. So you've seen this today. So now, um, this is a book by the cover trying to reflect the content, and this is the inside of the book. And these, um, it's all going automatically. On the new book. And this is a book where I sat with the author of the time, pasted the things This is a book about immigrants in Europe. And the reason for these two parts of the photograph on the right is to show that the person had arrived, the family they had one part of the photograph at home, and the immigrant, when he got, say, from Turkey to Germany, could send the other half. Then, if they put them together, they don't be really as right. He was being cheated by some traffic. Oh, this is an example of turning a picture around, and then it's being pictured on its side, which I think is basically something particularly in a book of this size. This is how not to do it. This is a famous book by the historian artist Ernest Gombrich, which shows that there's a variety of paintings on the right. Now, this is a new paper, uh, paperback, pocket version of the same book, where it has two bookmarks. So it's instead of having the painting where it's talked about on the page, it has the painting like this. And you have two bookmarks to go through where it's talked about. In the, in the text of the text, there's not this picture to scale. To the pages, as you see, and these are internal pages of this book, which again, when it was done, it, since it's a book about a television program or a series of television programs, this is an example of taking the portraits of the people on the, in the left hand page. It's trying to show that they were um, disgraceful, bourgeois, and that they were exploiting other people who can't quite be seen working at the A and the right. And um, so, I mean, they do look very sinister when they're taken out of this sort of uh, landscape context. Now, the type is all set in bone type because to make so to be as heavy as the image, so that people wouldn't. As they normally do, just skip through a book about art and look at the pictures. You more or less had to read it. It was also to emphasize the that all this television program, and you had to read it. In a television program, you can listen and you can look, but in a book, you can only read and look separately. So this was trying to get over that split. And here the images are presented almost as they were in the television program one by one interspersed within the text. And um, for example, the way the text speaks, it says, this is a landscape of a cornfield with birds flying out of it. Look at it. Then turn the page. And then underneath it is written, this is the best picture that Van Gogh painted before, the last picture that Van Gogh painted before he killed it. In other words, saying that you can know that a capture can actually change the way you look at something. 
inutile avere questa scritta su per ah, sognare con la percezione di quello stesso fotografia. Perhaps there is, um, don't talk about books, but I think probably I've answered your question about how you went on for the design of the book that you did. No, my question was uh, before designing, uh, you, uh, you made a lot uh, by pencil on paper. Yes, that was in pen, perhaps. It was on paper. Did you do a whole book and after you designed? Yes, yes. We wouldn't do all of it, but you would work out a structure. But you would go through the problem now is that something comes from the text and all that we're on, not as pages, but it comes as an email, which makes life impossible because you never have to print it out and so on. This this so uh, Okay. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the fact that you had two careers, it seems, and how you maybe juggled it, or it seems like you fused it clearly, but was there ever a going back and forth? Because I'm on sort of a similar path, I have two careers, and I'm trying to use them together, and I just want to hear your experience with writing and You mean being a designer and a writer? Well, that means if you're writing a book, you have to say to the people you're working for, I'm sorry, I'm terribly busy. So I won't be able to work for you for a bit. And I mean, the thing about it, you have to design to earn enough money to write because you don't make any money to write. I mean, it's a crazy thing. It's, um, so it's, it's uh, probably just vanity. And I, maybe I can tell you that I started, I wrote my graphic design illustrator book almost by mistake. What happened was that I said to a colleague, when you, if you'd like me to read it before you hand it in, um, I'll be happy to do so. I've been interested anyway, and maybe if there's something that I notice left out. And um, uh, I said to him after about a couple of years, I said, how is it going? And he said, oh, I just had it back from the publisher. I said, I I'm, can't go on with it. There was some extraordinary and stupid reason. I said, oh, well, I'll take it over. And that was what the time was. So I, I didn't use anything that he'd done at all because he took, he used graphic design more as art rather than as a as design in the approach of a predictive view. But I don't find it very uh, difficult, but it's partly a question of honouring in a way that the people who've done work which I admired. And I've done a very big book about Swiss graphic design because the designers whom I met when I was very young were very nice to me and talked to me, showed me things, and who for a very short time, in fact, influenced me. I felt people don't understand what they were doing and that it was important and I like it and I think other people should like it and, and understand what was in it. But it's, it's a lot of work and as I said, you don't have it. And it's not even much. Sometimes it's it's fun, but actually you're usually in tears at some point. It's really uh, hard, but uh, that, that's all. But I, in a way, I don't see them as 
as, as separate because in both cases I was able to design the book. And the awful thing is that friends of mine who are writers don't have any control over how their books are designed. And often you, when they're published, and you just feel so sorry for them because the book won't open. If the grain of the paper is going the wrong way, or the paper is horrible, the binding is horrible, the jacket isn't expressing the content of the book, and it's so, the whole business of publishing is very, very strange. That's why I'm starting to publish myself, and you'll see, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, but it, even if you do it yourself, it, it, things go wrong. Working in this way and uh, with uh, some uh, small publishers and uh, small productions, do you feel closer to the audience? And uh, do you have the idea to reach uh, some specific audience? Do you feel uh, closer? To the audience, when you to the audience, to the public. Also, real estate has changed. 
Hello. Um, we saw a lot of work during this lecture, and uh, in a lot of them, you said that you tried to cut down the prices to economize. I don't know if this is the right word. Um, I was just wondering if this is um, this was somehow related just to the client, or it was also your aim. I mean, how can I gotta say like a kind of good place where to live in in your work. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's absolutely right that the, I would try to economize because it was not I would say, oh, well, we could do this or we could do that. And they say, of course, they say, oh, wonderful, because they get even more. I mean, it's added value and it's, it's more fun. If you just do, otherwise you're tending to do more what you're doing. So it is something which generated, yes, I think I, in my case, I generated the idea because it was so. Thank you very much.